thank you for your comments. Wow. There's been a lot of work for me and Cynthia, and th there'll be more of that with the entering of the meta metadata, but we're hoping by Christmas, crossing fingers, hoping by Christmas to be done. There's just such a great opportunity. You know, imagine going through 500 pictures and documents from all the different organizations, and it is so amazing to see the opportunity to see the blow-ups from one little corner of a, a screen and be able to see faces in detail. And you can get there with a click and zoom in. That is exciting to me. First, the first MAD conference, 1885, we looked at that picture to find Olaf Hansen. And I was able to see James L. Smith in blow up. That is exciting stuff. Now, the history matters theme centered on oral history, oral interviews. And you know that hearing people conduct those oral interviews by taping them, tape recording. And so with us, we're videotaping the interviews in this project. That's a very exciting portion of getting the project going with the money applied for and received by MCDHH. And we want to take advantage of this Renaissance audience, including three folks, former Minnesotans, we're going to bring up Gerald Burstein. Bummy, where are you? Bummy, in back, come on up. Have a seat. Frank Turk. Frank, come on up, Frank. And finally, Mel Carter. Please come up. And while, we're, while they're here, I want you to have the opportunity to see and hear their perspective on Minnesota's history, their part in Minnesota history. And this is being filmed, so we're taking great advantage of this opportunity. Frank, where do you want to be? This is Frank Turk. My goodness, graduate from the Fairwell School. Raised, left, came, came back, involved with YLC camp, lots of events with the School for the Deaf, and Gerald Burstein, standing next to him, taught at Fairbolt, also was in involved with the deaf community, deaf organizations. We're pleased to have him here, and Mel Carter, also a former Minnesotan who taught at Fairbolt, at the School for the Deaf, and at St. Paul College. It was Mel who established and taught in the first interpreter training program. So we're happy to have you here to share your experiences. And Frank will begin. And they're discussing how much time to take. It's about time. We've had this great collection of people in front of you now. I'm Minnesota School for the Deaf has always been and always will be my home, my home city. The fact is that all other residential schools of the deaf in this country are my home as well. But this is where I came from. Whence the responsibility is that made me the way I am. And there are three groups of people. First, Minnesota School for the Deaf, where I developed my basic and specific knowledge of what it is for the American deaf community and how all of youth are entrusted to my care. My benefit must be their benefit. That's my own opinion. And I'm grateful for the Minnesota School for the Deaf. I will be forever grateful for what I am today. And second, Gallaudet University, where they taught me the grace of not, depend on, not, not depending on parents, not depending on teachers, depending on the people who you're with 24-7. And those are my peers. 
the most powerful influence on growth and development of a student is always the peer group. At Gallaudet, I was looking for a teacher to help me improve my language. And I raised the subject in an article. We met monthly. And we had the Buff and the Blue publication. It turned out to be the seniors and juniors and sophomores, that group of students, who did the research on their own and the writing. And at the Minnesota School for the Deaf, we also had the opportunity, to I had the opportunity to challenge myself to develop my writing skills. I depended on the teachers and other students, and we did the same thing. We would gather with that teacher for support, and that's what helped us to really take off in flight. And it was depending on them, that's where the idea came from for me, that okay, if I'm gonna develop myself to my fullest potential, And, so and socially, and physically, intellectually, and communication, communicatively, and emotionally. You've got to have peer help. Peers teaching peers, peers influencing peers, peers encouraging peers. And that's really where the, the real learning is with peers, learning from peers. In the acronym CPICE, -E, in my work with youth, teaching those young people how to overcome all in front of them. Where, where are the possibilities? So again, those three groups, including Gallaudet, and finally the third, the NAD, National Association of the Deaf, and once again, I involve myself with my peers, learning from my peers. And what makes people the most successful leaders? You have the obligation to be. Wherever you are, wherever you, and wherever you are today, that's where you come from. They had a student court. And they, they ran it by themselves, completely independently ran the group. And that was discipline and love. Disciplined by the coach. It was their love of me. Okay. And disciplined me because I loved myself. I came to accept criticism. Leaders must be able to accept criticism. It's critical to grow. Criticism, you have criticism is invited, not resisted. Accept it. The J. It's complimentary. It's a compliment. Jay said, this person is looking at you and don't think about ever, you have to look up to people. Let him continue to be, I'm sorry, jealous. This person had been jealous of me. Let him be jealous. How many of you know, 
Damon. Thompson. There were so many experiences that I had at MSAD and at Gallaudet University and at NAD through my youth that I that were influential for me and that have shaped my life. Next, we have Gerald Bern Bernstein here with us, and many of you know him as Bummy. And you may either stand there in your place or come forward, either one. Good morning. I have to let you know I'm on California time, and I'm still making the adjustment here. I arrived last night, so I was told by our own Doug Ball to give some factual information, but not to preach at the group. And so I gave that some thought. And I started mixing my stories. So I'm, I'm in the habit, I have to say, of talking about mixing stories of, from the Minnesota Academy of the Deaf and the, what the new word is, I'm not quite sure, but with the M-A-D, M-A, M-S-A-D, you know, the old fashioned, the, Min the, state, the Minnesota School for the Deaf versus the Minnesota State Academy for the Deaf. So I get those mixed sometimes. And so you may notice today that I do have a woman voicing for me, and I often have a woman's voice. Not always, but often. And there is a reason for that. I grew up, I was born deaf, <laughs> and grew up oral. All of my speech teachers were women. <laughs> so that is the reason that I now have to have female interpreters be my voice. So many people in Minnesota learned, if you just saw what I was signing, the letter P, a way to do, to form the letter P. And when, when I was growing up, that was what I learned. When I went to Gallaudet, having grown up in Brooklyn, it was foreign to me to see how Minnesota people formed the letter P. But at Gallaudet, I could spot them right away. It was when I was a senior at Gallaudet. And I, it was all of my uh, friends who were seniors had sent letters of application asking for uh, teaching jobs primarily. And I sent a letter off and got a letter back from Minnesota in February. And this was in February of 1950. And I thought, February is pretty early. You know, it seemed to me that I would have expected a letter in the spring, but. Uh, there were other schools that were replying, but I decided, well, why don't I go um, and do my teaching practice there and talk to the principal at Kendall School uh, and do some teaching practice there, perhaps, and check out the Minnesota School for the Deaf. And what they told me was the Minnesota School for the Deaf was a fabulous place. That was a wonderful place. And they said... Um, that if I would use if I used the wing system, the wing symbol system, you know, that that would be a, that would be a helpful that was what the the system that they used at Minnesota, but I wasn't quite satisfied with that with that answer. So, I went to see uh, President Elwood Elstead Elstead And he was the former superintendent, pardon me, that was superintendent of the Minnesota school. And he had become the Gallaudet president. 
So I asked him, I said, tell me a little bit about the School for the Deaf in Minnesota. And he said, yes, it is a good school, and told me much more about it. So I, after hearing that from him, was satisfied. I had gotten lots of positive feedback. And I thought, there has to be something negative, though. There has to be something bad about Minnesota. So I went to see Chet Debson, Dobson, who was a printer. And he had been, worked in the publishing area at the Minnesota School for the Deaf and uh, had been a, a, a professor at Gallaudet in printing. And uh, I asked him to be totally honest with me. And he said, well, Minnesota people are pretty cold. And I thought, well, that makes sense. There's a lot of snow up there in Minnesota that the people would naturally be cold. That just made sense to me. And he said, it's a tight group there. It's a very tight community. And I thought, well, and that is certainly is true, too. So I, after giving that more thought, I thought, I like a challenge. I sent back my letter to Superintendent Quigley and accepted. Now, this was in February, mind you. So this was in February, sent back, and um, he replied by telegram and said, congratulations. There's a telegram in my office, in my house somewhere, but I can't find it. But I think they're offering you $295 a month, plus room and board. And the room and board, of course, was on campus. And it was a, I thought it was a really good deal. And this was at $30 a month for the, the room and board cost. And I went to Fairbolt. I was there for 15 years. And I have to say that those were my best years, the time I spent in Fairbolt. Because you are all absolutely wonderful. I see some of students here, some of my former students. You were fabulous students. You were great. The students here taught me so much about farm-related things that I had never heard of before. And after learning about farming, about corn, the sign for corn, how you grow corn, it was fascinating. And then Oh, you know what happened? I now know the difference between <laughs> cows and horses. I finally know the difference between that, <laughs> thanks to the students that I had here in <laughs> Minnesota at Faribault. Growing up in New York, we didn't have any cows around. So, OK. While I was in Faribault for those 15 years, it is a small town, I, say, I must say. I got to know so many people in town. And what I learned from Faribault itself and from the school, I learned to play golf. Because the deaf school was the first to have a golf program, to, to have golf available for students. And I can remember Saturdays all day long, Sundays, walking to Shattuck School and playing golf. I, I remember there having basketball. I became a referee and was the, was the referee at the School for the Deaf for basketball. Had that badge on my, on my shoulder and the striped shirt and everything and was the referee. It was a city league. And we would um, we preferred uh, playing against other smaller hearing high schools. Uh, there was a Bible college, as I recall, that we also played against. Every Saturday in Faribault at 4 o'clock sharp, we would play a game with our superintendent. And this was at 4 o'clock, and <laughs> we were we played squash, and I swear, every week I was beaten. I maybe won once. 
Mel said, and was that the last one, though, the one that you won, that you he let you win? He said, now let me see, was that the last game I ever played? I don't know. But my point is, I owe a lot to my students, to my friends in from Faribault, Minnesota. There are so many things that bring back memories. I could go on and on and list more. After school, we often would have some quiet time and we did some flying. And I finally was able to t take a solo flight, I recall. I had gotten a student license and was ready. I had, of course, had to take do more study and had to fly more, to log more hours in order to get my license and to become a pilot. But um, unfortunately, they have never called me to become the pilot. California, pardon me, that California called me to leave the state, and so I would never was able to uh, become a pilot. But that's another memory I have. Oh, and I remember, too, that I bought my first car. Do you remember of the name? Does anybody remember the name of the car that I had? Oh, you... It was a... Hang on just a second. My first car was a Studebaker. It was a two-door, it was green, and that car I would bring to every football game, every basketball game. I brought students, I carted students around all the time. That was a good car. It, it allowed us to go wherever we needed to go. Uh, if I can maybe shift to um, MSD. M-A-D? There was a convention held, and it was annual every year, and I attended all of the conventions for 15 years straight. And you know how I had said earlier that Minnesota was such a tight community? Well, people at that time uh, did not necessarily be weren't that re receptive to outsiders coming in. Uh, and NAD also back then was talking about the various states becoming affiliated with the national organization, the National Association of the Deaf. And I really don't uh, know much, didn't know much about NAD at that time, but we established a committee. There were three of us. It was me, Gordon Allen, and you will recall Gordon Allen from this community, had been a leader here for uh, many, many years in Minnesota. And the third person was a teacher in Faribault, Herbert Selner. It was the three of us, uh, Herbert and advocated for NAD, for us to become an affiliated chapter with NAD. Gordon was the one who was a little reluctant about joining NAD because Minnesota had, had, had been such a tight community. And so we weren't sure. I mean, we talked about this for hours on end, and it seemed like days and days. Uh, and. You know, I was, I thought it seemed like a pretty good idea. Herbert was in favor of it. Gordon was a little reluctant. But finally, we came to an agreement to support the affiliation with the national organization, NAD. And so they then came to the MAD conference, and there, there was lots of hot discussion about that once we brought that idea to them. And I remember Gordon being uh, at the forefront of that discussion. Finally, the Minnesota Association voted to accept the affiliation, and the rest is history. Gordon and I had been great friends, uh, at, and I'm trying to think of what other states joined. There was someone named Griffin. The last name was, was another well-known person. Uh, this was someone from Oklahoma who also was uh, supporting the affiliation with NAD. And it was Gordon's good friend uh, who helped support his idea. M 
so it turned out Minnesota was the first state to affiliate with NAD, and Oklahoma was the second state. So we were first. See, so in 1950 was when I arrived in Minnesota, and that was the last year for the military uniforms at the school. I did see um, some drills with military uniform, but uh, that did not continue. They also had a women's drum corps. Was anybody here in the audience in the women's drum corps? Yes, there's somebody back here who was, right? Do you remember there was the drum corps? And it was all women. And they would, uh, they would come to the basketball games, go to basketball tournaments. They would travel with the team because of the significance of, of, of drumming, of course. And there would be people we would see who would actually be in tears. They would be inspired by the drumming. Do you remember that, Frank? You do, don't you? Yep. I learned a lot, not only from the students, but from the deaf leaders in Minnesota. And if I can just name a few, of course, the Gordon Allen, who I've already mentioned. Another is Leo Latz, and his son happens to be here, sitting in the front row as one of the team of interpreters. Ruben is here with us today, right? <laughs> Good to see you again, Ruben. And uh, certainly there are many, many other people that I could name if we had time. I always enjoy coming back to Minnesota. And I have been back a few times. In 1989, I came back for the MADC conference and uh, the uh, event at Thompson Hall. I was back again in 1991 as a speaker at the, at the MADC's 75th anniversary. And I am hoping to come back soon to give a parliamentary procedure workshop. But unfortunately, I was not invited. I was disappointed about that. I learned about parliamentary procedure from people here in Minnesota from my experience here. And I became a certified professional parliamentarian, the only deaf certified par parliamentarian in Minnesota. And, but I, in the United States, but it was Minnesota that gave me that start and the impetus. The sad part. When I was in the leadership training program in California, I got my master's degree there. It was in 1965. It was that year of 1965 that I heard that the School for the Deaf in Faribault was establishing a dean of students. Because they had a, a separate uh, dean of boys and a dean of girls uh, during my time. If I can remember now, the dean of girls was B.J. Lee, was that right? And they called her B.J., I think. And the dean of men was Staska, if I remember right. They then reported directly to the superintendent. The superintendent in 1965 th thought that perhaps it would be better rather than having two separate deans to just have one dean that reported to the superintendent. So I recall at that time sending off a letter because I was hoping that someone maybe would, if, would find that letter from wherever it is in their home and bring it. And uh, in that letter, I asked the superintendent about the dean position, and I said, if you are indeed establishing a single position, I would be interested in applying. I got a letter in return. It was an interesting letter. And what the response was is, this will not happen today. The letter said, we, uh, we will not be able to choose you for the position of dean 
because you must, that person must be able to talk on the telephone. That in the letter, he said that, and of course, that would not happen today, but uh, he, he said that well, what you're looking for is someone who has the ability to talk on the telephone so they can communicate with parents of the students. That was in 1965. And the leadership training program, I recall, is where, uh, where I had been gaining my training. From there, I was invited to teach in California. Let's see, now that was 65. And so then in 66 is when I started teaching in California. And I had hoped to come back to Minnesota, but that just did not work out. What I learned was the Faribault town itself established, now let me look, I have it written down what it was called. It was called the Faribault Vocational, oh, what was it? Faribault Vocational Hyphen Technical School. And the person who, ed who ran that school, some of you will remember this name, the last name was Freud, Frond, F-R-E-U-N-D. And you may remember his wife was from the Faribault School. And so what I found is once that uh, they hadn't uh, established that school uh, when I was looking for, the, for work, and uh, it, the timing it was just <laughs> off. And I have not heard back from them. I sent them a letter indicating an interest, and I never, ever heard back from them. It, but isn't that right? Mel, that they established that school right next to the school for the deaf, right? But yeah, I sent off a letter of interest, but never heard back. <laughs> no, is he still alive? Someone in the audience said that he's still. Why? What about his wife? Oh, his wife has passed away. He is still alive. I'll be darned. Anyway, just to summarize, I guess I would like to say. I mean, there's more and more that I could tell. But I just want to say, of all of my accomplishments and all of my achievements and all of the awards that I may have gotten over time, I would have to say are because of my experience in Faribault. And I remember in 1986, is that right? If I, no, let me, I wonder if I need to back up here. Okay, so in 1986, I flew to France. It was for the Laurent Clare anniversary celebration and your, the 250th birth of Laurent Clare. And at that time, I was president of the Gallaudet, Asso uh, Gallaudet University Alumni Association. And I flew to France to honor and to present them with a plaque that would be displayed then in Clare's hometown in France. And this, it, it was wonderful there. It was wonderful to see them. And the, they had a French national committee, or organization similar to our National Association of the Deaf. And this was the, so the National Association in France. And once our, we had made the presentation, and um, what I found is that French people wave their hands like this. They do not, they do not clap. They wave their hands like, we, like the deaf community does. And so this, I was there um, for, through the weekend. And on Sunday, the preacher of the local church had asked me if I would make a presentation. And so I picked up some French sign language. I was up on the stage. And the theme or the topic was the equality of deaf people and hearing people. And so I had picked up a little bit of French sign language and uh, signs that some of you may recognize from France, but I don't know that many of you will. But anyway, when, when I was done with my presentation, people stood up and waved their hands. And I was so impressed that these were not all deaf people that they knew that this, this is how you applaud for deaf people. And let me see if I can, I think right around the time of the, the Deaf President Now protest, and I don't know if you'll remember this, but I offered a parliamentary <coughs> procedure workshop right around that time. And I remember being around a campfire, and four of us were asked to make a presentation and to just, you know, basically reminisce and tell some stories. And I think I was third or fourth in line. 
So the first person got done with their storytelling. I think it, they were in the campers clap. They applauded for the first presenter. And the second presenter was done, and there was applause for that person. And then it was my turn. And I thought, well, let's see. Now, what should I say? And I thought, well, let me tell you. I'll tell them the story about my experience in France. So I talked about how waving the hands is a way to applaud. And when I was done, instead of giving me a hand, hand clapping for applause, it was the hand waving. The fall after that, I remember walking on the Gallaudet campus somewhere, and some runners came by, and they someone, I didn't, of course, recognize who they were, and the person said, I was at the camp you were at last year. Do you remember me? And of course, I didn't. And they, and I said, why? What did I do? What is it that you remember? He said, oh, no, no. It's the whole thing that you taught us about waving hands as a way of applauding for deaf people. And uh, I, I learned that from you. I appreciate your invention. And I said, oh, no, no, I didn't invent that. I, I was telling the story that that's what I had learned in France about the method of applause. So anyway, thank you very much. Uh, back to the honor that I received from Gallaudet, the honorary doctorate degree that I received. In the audience, of course, there were many people there. There was one person who approached me, and it was, guess who, Quigley, who had been the former superintendent of the School for the Deaf. He had retired and moved to the Washington, D.C. area to work for CEPAN, C-E, it was a C-E-A-S-D, it was a teaching association, a teaching group, and he happened to be in the audience, and I did not know that, but he approached me afterwards and congratulated me. And you know, of all the excesses, I, what I told him is that of all the successes I've had in my life, I, I attribute much of my success to my experience in Faribault. And so in closing, let me just say it's a pleasure to be here, and I wish you all in Minnesota the best of luck. Thank you, Bummy. Great inspiration to us. And Mel, can you stay put for a few minutes? And we'll have Mel. If you need to leave, we know we're leaving at noon for lunch, and I know you're hungry, but it's such a tough act to follow Bummy. I'm thrilled and inspired, and always am, by Minnesota. When I was a prep at Gallaudet, Jerry Carstens was my first pal, the bad boy from Minnesota. He's a good boy, too, at Gallaudet. Am I wrong? Have I get, got that mixed up backwards? But Jerry told me wonderful things about Minnesota that were inspiring at that time. So when I moved later to Minnesota, I knew I was in the right place. I, I've got to really condense my comments here, but MSAD is right, because MSAD is a school for the deaf and MAD together. They're in the same word, MSAD. Great. <laughs> Arriving here in Minnesota, my first impressions were that people were always moving, always moving forward. They were active, active in the community, not just at the School for the Deaf, not just at the state level, but in the communities active and meeting those people. And today now I, I recognize, and I had a tear in my eye this morning, seeing someone on stage who was a child when I was there. And that is goose fleshing for me. Gloria, mother of somebody who was up here. Pacown and Teka. It was her that forced my wife and I to leave the campus and meet the parents and get into an organization called the Minnesota Association of Deaf Parents. And it was shocking to me at the time. I remember that not the, the numbers are different and it's changed. The organization has changed now to what, MSDC or something? Minnesota Society for Deaf Children. But it's for parents. And because of that, we had to go to their, into their homes. It wasn't part of the School for the, Deaf, for the Deaf programming, but it was inspiring for us to have the opportunity to get into the community, to meet people, to 
getting out to Albert Lee to meet parents. And again here, I say, take it. Your success and your story is wonderful. And I wonder about your parents. But we were able to see through her, your mom, deaf other parents here. And the level of activity is just amazing to me, just active people. But many people say, you know, you first need to ask Gordon. And I, Gordon, ask Gordon. You have to ask Gordon first. And I asked my wife. And we were going to go and look for Gordon and his wife, Myrtle. My gosh, an awesome couple. Again, inspiration from Minnesota. Great, rich history and rich couplehood. Getting to Fairboat, who had I met them? Potters, right there. And they invited us to their home for dinner. <laughs> and Kathy and Jim, and we just stayed and stayed. Wow. The Minnesota Association of the Deaf has... Couples, the Allens, the Moes, Lloyd and Kathy. You remember them? Francis Crow and his wife, Rose. Yes, Rose Crow. You remember her? Oh my gosh. And many, many couples. One particularly that recognizes the Joneses, Jim Jones and Eldora Jones. And this year, you know what? <laughs> They're still married. In California, I couldn't say the same thing about deaf couples there. The divorce rate, the divorce rate, the divorce rate just repeats itself. But really, couples are special. And things, people are always working together. And we always talk about having our wives behind us. You know, before or behind, you know, we're not ashamed of each other. We get on with it. D, now D, dedication, loyal to all, everything about life. Dedicated to life, really. I remember four things that tied together. Equality, and they're tied together equally. Active is the first. Love is the second. Play and fourth. Sleep well. <laughs> I got that from Minnesota. And I still love people. And I still love to play. And I still have to eat. <laughs> and I still rest because of Minnesota. That w those were the lessons. You taught deaf people the right ways to live. And the equal part, maybe we'll bring that down here and turn it into a cross. Not cross at the top, but cross in the middle. So we are all equal. Minnesota has a great impact on deaf people in the United States. Bright, active, artistic, involved. And the last thing I want to say to you today is I'm glad that I came back because of Doug Ball. And Myrtle, Gordon Allen, it's like a reminder. I'm happy that people are still coming back here. I think about you and Sharon, a reminder from Myrtle. And Doug Ball said, please come. And if it came from Myrtle, yes, we need young people. We need you young people. Young people make the difference for your future. And young people will become older too, like me. <laughs> and now, I wish you and your history and all the historians here, historians in the making, it's great to see you again. And for each of you, I know you have your own stories to tell, and those are powerful stories. And again, I'm inspired by one, Bummies and Franks and Doug. And if we look around the room, there are more, many more inspiring stories, and we have to make those known. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. And I thank you especially for inviting me to come back and share. I wish I could share more, but later we'll, we'll sit down and talk more. And we'll have those conversations, OK? <laughs> thank you. Thank you all. History matters. And I know you've got stories, too. Like Mel just said, we're starting this here. And I'm sorry, to, we're a little bit behind schedule. 
But again, I want to invite any of you who are interested, feel free to join us and join the MADC History Committee. See me or see Cynthia Weitzel. Thank you. Hi, I feel so inspired. Do you feel as inspired as I do out there? Yeah.